A belt grinder like this is very handy for shaping the bevel of the Epona shoe. Also for removing material to make the shoe narrower or shorter. If you don't have a grinder handy, this can all be done with a rasp. Epona shoe allows you to easily choose the size of the bevel at the toe. The size of the bevel depends on the situation. Often, for an upright hoof, we use a smaller bevel, as in A, whereas for a long toe, low heeled hoof, we use a bigger bevel, as in C. Imagine that we have a barefoot hoof, and we're convinced that this trim is perfect for the horse's biomechanical movement. The question then is, how do we add a shoe without affecting the fundamental biomechanics? A simple biomechanical model shows what happens at the instant of breakover, when the heel is just starting to lift up and the toe is pushing off the ground. At the instant of breakover, a relationship exists between tendon force and force applied by the toe on the ground. In order not to disturb this relationship, we need to add a shoe in such a way that the lever arm out to the toe, indicated here as LB, is not changed. As long as we keep the push-off point of the shoe somewhere on this red arc, LB will not have changed, and the biomechanical relationship remains intact. A thin shoe, placed and beveled like this, does not affect the breakover biomechanics. The thicker the shoe, the more apparent the bevel becomes. The opponent shoe is a little bit thicker than a metal shoe, and even more so if a glue layer is added. So, in general, the opponent shoe needs to be set back and beveled a bit more than a metal shoe would be. The bevel starts quite wide, from the red arrows shown here, with the main part of the bevel in the area indicated here. On horses with naturally longer toes, we try to set the shoe back and bevel more. On horses with a more upright hoof, the shoe does not need to be set back as far. Here's a rule of thumb for how to set the shoe back and how much to bevel. Draw a line from the hairline through the tip of the pedal bone. It should hit the ground right at the breakover point. The blue pad of the opponent's shoe is soft and helps to avoid pressure points on flat-footed horses. But for founder or other special cases, it can be grinded in order to apply less pressure to the sole. We found the need for this to be rare, but it may be useful in some special cases. In some cases, you may wish to bevel all the way around the shoe. This is easy to do with opponent's shoe. This animation illustrates different ways that a hoof might flex when loaded. The slippery surface of a metal shoe, combined with the fact that all of the load is placed on the wall, tends to cause lateral spreading of the heels. Maximum lateral spreading occurs when there is no frog support and the heels rest on a low friction surface. This spreading of the hoof in a metal rim shoe is not necessarily natural for the hoof. It is to some extent a consequence of the metal rim shoe. A barefoot horse, or a horse in the opponent shoe, will not experience very much lateral spreading, because the frog is supported, resulting in reduced peripheral loading, and the wall is supported on a frictional surface. With frog support and a frictional surface, the hoof tends to bulge on load, rather than spreading. Please note, this animation shows an exaggeration of the effect we're describing, in order to illustrate the point we're making which is that Epona shoe can be fit tight to the hoof. There's no need to leave the Epona shoe much wider than the hoof. In the case of metal shoes, we don't particularly like the concept of trailers, meaning the shoe is extended out behind the heels. Even if you believe in some benefit to trailers, it probably doesn't make sense with a flexible shoe, as the trailers would just flex up instead of providing whatever function it was you were after. So we also fit tight to the hoof in the back of the foot. Typically, the amount of shoe going past the hard heel should only be one quarter to three eighths of an inch. Part of finding how to place the shoe is to assess if the hoof capsule has twists and or flares in it. So we promote the concept of shoeing to the bony column, which means we attempt to ignore flares and twists and set the shoe relative to the bones of the lower leg. In part eight of this video series, we introduce the bone referenced trim. Here we make use of this idea to avoid setting the shoe to a flare. We palpate at the coronary band to locate bony references that we call the coronary gaps. These are soft spots caused by underlying anatomy. 
and are associated with the position of the P2 bone. These are the closest bone-related reference points to where we'll place the shoe. If they can't be located, or you want to double-check, you can feel for bony eminences near the distal end of the long pastern bone. Having found the coronary gaps, try to visualize where they would appear on the sole if they were projected orthogonally down to the sole plane. It's a technique that can help you identify a flare, and this way of thinking aids in choosing shoe placement. A primary feature of the bone referenced method is that it can help you avoid setting the shoe to a flare. Here's a DP radiograph of a right front hoof. Let's imagine that this white outline illustrates the hoof, and we can see that there is a lateral flare. The blue rectangle represents a shoe that has been set to the flare. But this is what we'd like to avoid. Rather, we want to set the shoe to the bone, as indicated here. Now this is a simplified and somewhat abstract depiction, just used to help make our point understood. In the real world, you might have to split the difference with nature, and set the shoe partially towards the flare, and hope that on the next cycle things will work themselves out. The bone reference trim and shoe placement, along with careful attention to proper medial lateral balance, can get you some great results, sometimes requiring several shoeing cycles to see the full benefit of a good trim and a well-placed opponent shoe.